Hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I think we've got most people here. Um, yeah, I think we're all here. Squeeze into this room. Thanks for your patience and hope you had some coffee and water and some cannolis, um, courtesy of our Italian heritage. So good to see you all. Um, good morning. Thank you all for coming. My name is James from Visa. I will be your MC today. Um, welcome to Visa Global Logistics Erskine Park facility. It's great to have you all here. Um, we're thrilled. This is our 2019 Visa Information Forum, so a good opportunity to get everyone together. Um, customers, suppliers, customers new and existing, also prospective customers, um, a few industry people, some key people in, in the industry um, to make some important announcements today. And we're going to be running these throughout the year. Um, this is the way we're going. We want to host these kind of events to give people an update on what's happening in the industry and also a good opportunity for some networking as well. Um, just quick housekeeping as well, if you could all switch your phones to silent, please, um, just so we don't have any Apple iPhones going off during the course of the, the morning, um, and that would be great. Bathrooms over here to my left, in case you need to run. It's unlocked, so you won't have to kick the door in. Um, and they are also accessible downstairs, guys. Um, for your safety, please remain within the office space of the facility and be mindful that our warehouse and transport departments are operational today, so there will be some people moving around the facility. If you need assistance, don't hesitate to ask myself, Christelle, our lovely marketing manager who's put it on today. Round of applause for Christelle, everyone. Um, or any other staff. So we have an exciting lineup of speakers today hailing from all parts of the supply chain. First, we have Jeff Greenwood, Managing Director of Hamburg Sud Australia and New Zealand. Andrew Crawford, Head of Border and Biosecurity from the FTA. Joanne Castle, Program Coordinator from Border Watch. Mark Hume, Chief Operating Officer at DP World Australia. Neil Chambers, Director of the CTAA Alliance. And Scott Walker, our very own National Transport Manager for Visa Global. <laughs> Round of applause. So our speakers are here today um, to share their insights into the industry. Um, we will open the floor also for a Q&A panel at the end where you'll be able to ask a few questions to our expert panellists. We've got a few questions already prepared, um, which we'll coordinate and then also we'll take some questions from the audience as well. Um, and our, our presenters, I should say, are doing a bit of a presentation of their own. So if you focus your attention up here to the screens, um, you'll be able to see some of their slides and it'll be a good opportunity to get their perspectives um, and importantly, challenges in the industry now um, and future outlook on where we see things going. We are live streaming as well, ladies and gentlemen. So that is a big um, progressive move for Visa Global um, and for the industry. Very important for staff across Australia, customers, suppliers who couldn't be here. Um, so please be on your best behaviour. Um, do not walk in front of the camera if you can avoid it. Um, rubber necking, it's totally fine. I'm just taking, taking the mic. Um, but it is true, we're live on YouTube. So that's a good opportunity for the company. Um, so before we proceed with the presentations, however, I'd like to invite up Christian Sayers, Visa's National Safety Manager, to do a quick safety induction. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're having a lovely time today at the, uh, at the Visa Industry Forum. So look, I'd just like to point everyone's attention to the fact that we are an operating site today. Um, outside, as you can see, we've got our reach stacker operating and picking up containers and putting them on trucks. So there are three entry points to the outside area that I'd like you to pay attention so that you don't go out to those areas. There is a side gate out here that you're not to enter. There's also down at the back where the amenities are down uh, downstairs. There's a door to the warehouse. Please do not go through that door. And also on the far end of the car park to the right, you'll see a gated area that takes you out to the warehouse, okay, just for your own health and safety. In the event of an, uh, of an emergency and we have to evacuate the building, please um, obviously don't run, but go downstairs. Myself, Scott Walker, and also Talal Kanch. So if everyone can just turn, Talal's just in the corner there at the back door, just please make yourself aware. So Talal's our New South Wales State Warehouse Manager. Either one of us three will guide you out, okay? And the muster point is out towards the back, through the gate at the back of the car park, going down Lenore Drive and it, Lenore Road, and it's just on 133 Lenore Drive, okay, is the muster point. If you've got any questions at all about today um, in relation to safety, please uh, feel free to come and see myself. So we take safety very seriously here at Visa. All right, thank you very much, and uh, I'll pass it on now. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, up next to deliver the formal welcome to today and draw the lucky prize of $100 of a visa travel voucher, please welcome Vittorio Taki, Executive Director and Founder of Visa Global. Um, good morning to all. Um, I'm Vittorio Tarki. I'm one of the executive directors of, uh, of Visa. Uh, thank you for joining us here today for the 2019 Visa Industry Forum. Um, uh, welcome to Erskine Park. This is our fifth new facility in the last in the last four years that, that we open. So as you probably know, Visa has, um, has been undergoing fairly uh, fast growth in the last uh, in the last four or five years, uh, both here and overseas. So. Uh, Eskin Park has been going on. It's been opened uh, about six months ago, seven months ago, and um, we are right in the middle of the ramp up, um, and things are going very well. And we're looking already at, the, at our next facility. So, thank you for uh, for coming to customers and uh, friends. Um, today we welcome here industry experts who will share their insight. Uh, into the challenges we are facing in uh, freight forwarding and uh, logistics, uh, especially especially in Sydney, which is the most difficult uh, city to do to do business uh, in, in respect to transport and uh, terminals, uh, etc. So I'd like to express my sincere thanks to to our guest speakers, who've taken time out today uh, from the busy schedule to to join us here. Um, so before I pass. Um, the microphone back to James. Uh, um, we'll be drawing a name from the lucky, from the lucky draw, and to win a visa gift pack of a hundred dollar, hundred travel badge, hundred dollar travel badge or something. I don't know how far you get with that, but <laughs> <laughs> you get you get to North Sydney. <laughs> we might increase that, you know. <laughs> Simon Baker. Schneider. <laughs> Take a photo. Yes, of course. Hey, Simon, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, well, okay, <laughs> Thank you. Right, thank you. Here's uh, James. <laughs> Thank you, Vittorio. All right, let's get our presentation underway, everyone. Um, please join me in welcoming our first guest speaker, Jeff Greenwood, Managing Director of Hamburg Sud ANZ, who will give us an update on ocean freight. Um, and Jeff has been working in Hamburg Sud and the shipping industry for over 30 years. Please help me in welcoming Jeff. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Visa for allowing us to come and speak to you today. It's a real opportunity for us, and it's a real pleasure to do so, too. Um, <clears throat> normally, we do a presentation on what's going on in the shipping industry and talk about some of the global drivers and, and, um, and some of the things that impact as far as carriers, how we operate, why we operate, why we do some of the things that we do. We're compressed for time, so we're going to try and cover a couple of points in that. A lot of it's more about supply and demand, and a lot of it's about what's happening with trade volumes. But we also want to spend some time focusing on I think one of the biggest things to hit the carrier side of the industry, which is in January 2020 with the new IMO 2020 regulations. So we'll get to that, and that's where we really want to talk about bunker fuel and things like that. So um, hello, YouTubers, and that's one of the best, oldest pictures I can see of myself anyway. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so container volume, container transport growth, global economic growth. So when you think of global economic growth, you can you still hear me this way? Yeah. Yep. When you think about global economic growth, you, you look at GDP as far as developing countries, economic output as far as in what they're doing. And there used to be a really direct correlation between economic output, GDP, and containerized volume. So if you go back to pre-global financial crisis, pre-2008, um, <clears throat> when you looked at GDP of, of, of um, uh, global GDP of, let's say, 5%, generally there's a multiplier factor of about five to, or three times so we'd see global container growth worldwide as far as growing by sometimes up to 12 to 15 percent. That's really unusual as far as for a global industry because most global in there's not many global industries that have an annual year-on-year -year growth rate of more than 10 percent. So if you look at the top line, so the <clears throat> kind of greeny yellow line, that's the container volume transport growth 
in terms of percentage growth year on year. And the bottom line, the gray line, or blue line, represents as far as the average global GDP as far as for that year. So kind of forget about going backwards as far as before the GDP. What we're seeing now as far as in global container growth is we're seeing a much more mature um, trade. And we're not seeing the 10 plus percent growth levels. We're not seeing the kind of the five plus percent growth levels as far as from really from kind of 2010 to 2014. What we're seeing now is a much more mature growth because a lot of things in the world have changed. A lot of things in the world have changed that um, trading has become more regionalized. A lot of containerized cargo or conventional cargo has already been containerized. So the only thing that's really going to be containerized going forward in the future is a lot of refrigerated cargo that's been moving in bulk refrigerated vessels that's now moving into containers. So the average growth rate on the top line, we're forecasting the new norm as far as from container shipping is somewhere between three to 5%. 2017 was a bit of an anomaly. They were probably at about six and a half to 7%. But really what we're looking for going forward is probably a 4%, 4% growth rate worldwide. And that does deviate trade by trade, but that's the new norm. Now you think about shipping companies and shipping companies have to build ships to meet, to stay with the organic growth. Before 2008, we had to build 10% more capacity year on year to just stay with the organic growth of the market, let alone as far as trying to increase your market share and do things like that. Um, to build a container ship, generally speaking, you have to place your order in somewhere between one year and two and a half years before you place that order based on your forecasting and what you're going to need to when you take delivery of a vessel. So <clears throat> now we look at probably a little bit more complicated charts. So maybe go over the very right hand bar which is what the standing capacity is in the world today. You stop all the ships, you count all the containers, and generally speaking, there's just shy of 24 million containers of capacity floating on the water at any point in time. Green line again represents as far as the annual cellular growth, as far as containerized growth in the market, and the blue line represents as far, sorry, and the blue line represents as far as the global transport growth or throughput growth. What we're seeing now and what we're seeing from 2000, probably 2016 to 2019 is we're not seeing a big fundamental change between volume growth as far as in the market and containerized growth. That's actually a good thing because shipping lines sometimes can be accused of not being the smartest, the smartest companies because we tend to chase after market share. We tend to build bigger ships for better economies of scale, yet there's not enough cargo as far as to fill those ships on a particular trade lane basis or even on a global basis. So carriers have got a lot of tools as far as to try and restrict capacity. One of the best ways to restrict capacity is to build less ships. Um, the other ways are to park vessels during, uh, during slack seasons. The other ways are to basically look at scrapping your vessels earlier. The point of this chart is, is that we're looking at a better balance going forward as far as from 2019 going into 2020, 2021. But there will be a spike up again because now there's been some big orders as far as for some VLCCs, very large container ships, which are larger than 14,000 TUs. Carry consolidation. So this is very definitely something that is um, that has hit Hamburg Sud in 2000, the end of 2017. Hamburg Sud, which had been a privately owned shipping company owned by the Utka Group in Germany for uh, well about 130 years, were sold to Maersk Line. And for those of us who've been around for a long time, particularly with this company. It was a bit of a devastating move, but it was the right move at the right time because Hamburg Sud was basically sitting in the same position as where Evergreen was, number seven in the world. But we also knew that we didn't have the economies of scale to be able to compete as far as on a global basis and to be able to keep compete with some of the larger carriers as far as in the world. So now we're part of the MERS group. And the MERS group now represents about 4.2, 4.3 million TUs of capacity at any given point in time. The point on this chart is, is that you've got global carriers. So you've got the top seven carriers, which represent uh, almost 78% almost of the capacity that's in the world today. If you take a look at the top 13 carriers, they represent about 88% of the capacity <coughs> in the world today. If you look at this industry, probably in the next five years, maybe even not, not that long, we're going to consolidate very similarly to what has happened in the airline industry. So there's going to be quite a, there's, there's still going to be further consolidation in this market. And I'm just going to see, yeah. So what happens? So you've got, number one is, is um, this is by capacity as Maersk and Hamburg Sid. Number two is MSC. Number three is Costco with double OCL. And number four is CMA, CGM. All those carriers have appetites as far as for further expansion. Some of them do it through different ways. Some of them do it through acquisitions. Some of them do it through organic growth. But the question's really going to be, is it, Hapag Lloyd, One Network, Evergreen are still very large carrier groupings, but how are they going to compete on a global basis as far as when you see these very large four carriers in ranking one through four? 
Second question is really going to be sitting as far as what happens as far as with the medium-sized carriers. And there are some very good carriers as far as within that group. Very definitely PIL, uh, Wanhai, Zim will always be independent. But there still is going to be a change. And the point to this slide is there will be a change as far as in the landscape and the container shipping industry in probably the next three to five years. So we've gone through a last round of, nego of, um, of acquisitions. And um, I, would fair, I, I would guess that there's probably going to be another round within the next two to three years. That just gives you an idea in terms of overall operating capacity. That slide's slightly old, or that section is slightly old, but that just gives you a ballpark idea as far as what the overall market shares are. So the MERS group, including Hamburg City, including MERS Line, including Sealand, including um, some of their other operations, represent about 18% as far as the capacity of world trades. Trade volumes. Um, so these are import trade volumes as far as coming into Australia over the last 12 months. And um, it's kind of interesting when you take a look at it that we've seen very strong growth as far as out of the Asian markets, particularly out of North Asia, out of South Asia, and out of Southeast Asia. We've also seen some pretty good growth as far as coming out of the Middle East and, um, and also in the European market. Some of that is related as far as to some of the trade disputes that we're seeing going on in the world. So when you see disputes going on between Europe and the US, the US as far as in China, it opens up opportunities. And some of those opportunities is looking at diversification and some of that diversification as far as coming into the Australian and New Zealand trades. We'll talk about this in the, on the export basis in a second. What's really interesting is it to watch is what's happening as far as with the US. And the US is actually, generally speaking, the United States trade into Australia and New Zealand has been growing at sort of four to 5% per year. But we saw that sub being subdued over the last 12 months. Conversely, on the inbound side, that if you look at it, pretty much a negative uh, or, a, or a flat red zero in terms of overall growth, in terms of exports coming out of Australia as far as into the different world markets. The two markets that stand out is Japan and Korea, and the, and the other market that stands out is the US, uh, Canada, US East Coast and West Coast. Japan and Korea is really interesting. The economy is really strong. They've got a real flavor as far as for buying Australian goods, agricultural goods, produce, meat, things like that. And that's been the main driver. Um, if you look at the North American market, that's the really interesting one because if you look at the trade dispute that's going on between the U.S. and particularly China, um, one of the main, one of the fastest growing commodity groups is in the metal side, on the aluminum side, on the zinc side, as far as that a lot of minerals and things like that are being moving to the U.S., which weren't moving before. Most of that was being supplied as far as out of China. So we're now seeing as far as some opportunities based on some of these trade wars. But for all intents, the export trades as far as out of this country have also been impacted as far as by the drought. So when you think about the grain industry, you think about the hay industry, the meat industry is slightly different because when you have a very, very dry season, you kill a lot of cattle, and a lot of cattle goes out the door and out of the country. Um, but we're now seeing a fair bit of rain, so we're going to probably see this picture start to reverse a little bit, and we're going to start to see a hold back as far as on some commodities, like cattle, because there is rain, there is grass to feed, and we're going to start to see a lot more movement as far as in the next seasons as far as of the grain of the hay and things like that picking back up principally into northeast asia where a lot of it's been going traditionally okay so um fuel prices um <clears throat> i think before we we get into what's happening with bunkers and what shipping companies are doing and how shipping companies are handling this heavy cost in terms of how we have to operate is let's talk about the fuel industry and let's talk about the petroleum industry Crude oil kind of gets broken down. The crude that comes out of the ground in a barrel gets broken down into three major components. It goes into heating oil and general petroleum products, goes into asphalt and bitumen, and then there's this other third section, which is the heavy fuels, some of the fuels that we've been burning on our ships. When you look at production, so um, OPEC, probably the biggest name, OPEC produces about 32 to 33 million barrels of crude per day. Um, the U.S. produces, in terms of their shale oil production, somewhere between 9 to 11 million barrels of, of, of crude per day. Venezuela is just starting up again. They have a capacity of about 3 million barrels. There's a point to this. Nigeria is about 2.5. Canada, 3 million to 7 million barrels per day. Canada is really interesting, kind of linked as far as to the U.S. too. The Canada, the Athabasca tar sands in northern Alberta, is one of the largest deposits as far as of oil petroleum in the world. But you need um, crude prices to be more than $50 a barrel for them to economically produce it. Kind of similar scenario as far as with shale oil in the U.S. <clears throat> in December of 2018, OPEC decided that they're going to pull back as far as 1.2 million tons of fuel out of production in the market, which created the spike that you're seeing as far as in the, at the end of 2018, where you saw it start to rise as far as, as we go into 2019. Then you start to see the fuel fluctuate a little bit because the U.S. started stepping in, and basically the U.S. has become self-reliant as far as on fuel, on fossil fuels. 
So they started upping their production as far as on shale oil, and the price as far as per barrel of fuel went up well above $55 a barrel. The Brent oil gram, which is, Brent is probably one of the best forecasting things for, for fuel, uh, tools for fuel, <coughs> excuse me, and Brent is forecasting the average price is going to be $68 a barrel as far as through 2019. That means that in these high cost areas like Canada and like the US, that you're probably going to see more production coming out of those markets. So how does that impact the overall fuel price worldwide? I don't know. Um, that's, that's, that's really the tough one because, <clears throat> because now we're getting into another scenario. <clears throat> excuse me. So this chart is to represent that uh, the fuel we, <clears throat> excuse me, the fuel we burn on our ships is IFO 3, 380. That fuel is a 3.5% sulfur content fuel. That's a fuel that the world doesn't like. That's a fuel that we're going to talk about as far as with the IMO. Um, that's the main fuel burn that we have. In the, in the um, environmental um, uh, exclusion areas, as far as around Europe, around North America, around China, our ships are forced to switch their fuel tanks and go from a 3.5% fuel to a 0.1% fuel to burn this very, very low sulfur fuel as far as within these 200-mile borders as far as of those areas. Um, and the price point as far as between the 0.1% fuel and the price point between the 3.5% um, the fuel is roughly around $200 a ton. That seems to be a pretty good average as you go through averages as far as through the year. That's relevant because $200 a ton is a big swing when we switch over. And shipping companies can't afford this, and we'll talk to you about that now. So you take the top 20 shipping companies in the world, and you look at the operating margin as far as on how they're performing. And these are the top 20 shipping companies that are publicly listed that produce their results. And as you can see, there's a lot of numbers, there's a lot of bars as far as below the break-even line versus a lot, of, um, a lot of quarters as far as above the break-even line. Shipping companies have not been performing well over the last 8 to 10 years. If you look at the um, <clears throat> if you look at the first quarter or if you look at the fourth quarter as far as of 2018, you are seeing a positive number. You are seeing shipping lines as far as becoming more profitable, but that's due to a couple of different things. That's due to as far as some more cargo moving. It's due to better balancing as far as of the capacity versus what's moving as far as in the um, in the world uh, in terms of containerized cargo and capacity that's meeting that. It's due to better management programs. That carriers are getting a little bit smarter in terms of how they're managing their capacity. But carriers are also looking at um, uh, carriers are also looking at as far as different ways as far as to cut their costs. And some carriers who've led the way in terms of EBIT and performance or results is basically being driven by cost management more than anything else. So the point on this slide is is that with all these additional costs as far as a fuel, carriers can't absorb anything more than what they're doing today, and they have to pass on fuel prices as far as to our customers. IMO 2020. So the IMO, uh, International Maritime Organization, which is part of the UN, UN passed an edict <clears throat> that shipping companies, so we were the target, we have been the target for the last four or five years, that from January 1, 2020, shipping companies basically have to burn, uh, they can't burn the 3.5% as far as fuel per year uh, on their main deep sea burn, that they have to shift down as far as to a 0.5% fuel. So on January the 1st, and the one really kind of curious thing on this is, is that there's not a lot of production of 0.5% as far as sulfur content fuel that's being produced today. That's something that's coming forward, and that's something that's starting to be built uh, as far as refineries, blending, things like that as far as in the industry between now and the end of the year. Um, uh, the target as far as for the shipping industry is to reduce your nauseous emissions by 75% as far as as we move forward into January 1st, 2020. That means carriers are going to have to find a way as far as to not only purchase this fuel type, but also find a vehicle as to how can you pass these charges back on to your customer. And this is one of the most important things that we're talking to our customers now, that there's going to be a fundamental change in terms of how we calculate the fuel prices and the fuel adjustment factors that we pass on to our customers. And, but we also want to be more transparent in terms of what we're doing. Hembrick said welcomes as far as the, um, this new regulation because it is environmentally more responsible. It is more sustainable. Um, so in 2020, um, there's kind of three methodologies as far as for carriers to be compliant as far as with the UN and with the IMO regulation. Uh, I'll probably start from the bottom then work our way up. Ships can convert as far as to, um, to LNG propelled vessels. Clean fuel, um, plentiful, but only in certain locations. But the big challenge as far as with LNG conversion as far as of a lot of vessels is it can only be converted as far as or only be built as far as with new engines on new ships. 
and it can only only probably be run as far as on a very small percentage, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the vessels that exist today that are operating and flowing around the world. So the challenge in LNG is it's great, it's plentiful, it's reasonably well priced, um, but the issue is probably twofold: is it one supply points, and the other one is that not a lot of vessels, as far as can accept LNG. Um, scrubbers is the second one. Uh, so scrubbers is an attachment that goes on the stack of the vessel. And those attachments, as far as are, one, they're expensive. Two, you have to take your vessels out of a useful life in terms of you have to take them over to a dry dock, have them installed. And when they're installed, they basically have to, then you have to figure out as far as how you're going to pass back that 10 or $15 million as far as back to your customers. And how can you make that transparent as far as back to your customer base? The other one is, too, that if fuel prices do come down with this new IMO 0.5% fuel, how are you going to then justify that you put these scrubbers on your ship when the fuel prices in the market are, are uh, their prices have come down? So the chosen method for a lot of carriers is to basically be compliant, buy the 0.5% fuel, and then find a way as far as to make it transparent and back, pass that costing, costing back on to your customers. Um, <clears throat> so the impact as far as to the industry that of the, um, that's been pretty well um, agreed by all the major CEOs of the global shipping lines is the impact of this fuel type to the industry is about $30 billion, somewhere between 30 and $35 billion. When you look at the operating margins that we showed you before, the industry itself can't absorb that. So we have to find a way to pass that on. The general estimation is the cost per TU of this fuel type, and it will vary, and I know I'm going to get wrapped up in two seconds, it will vary between different trade lanes. But if you take the world global trade is about 165 million TUs moving worldwide. If the cost of the industry is about uh, 30 to 35 million dollars, that generally speaking, simple math is about 180 dollars per TEU of additional costs. It's going to come to the shipping company. The shipping companies are get, then going to be passing back as far as their customer base. There isn't much of an option but to do that. So how are you going to do it? So the carriers are going to come up. A lot of carriers have come up with a very similar formula. Uh, for Hamburg said, I can probably explain that better, is that we want it to be transparent, we want it to be predictable, that we will be, um, and we're starting to put this pricing into effect today with a lot of our new contracts, that the formula will be based on four stemming points around the world. It'll be Rotterdam, Singapore, Panama, and Fujara. And these are probably the most popular stemming points as far as the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere when you buy your fuel. So it's gonna basically be the bunker price, times the trade factor, which will give you the fuel adjustment factor that we'll be passing on as far as to the market. Um, I'll go to this slide. So when you look at as far as the trade factor, the trade factor is built in a couple of different things. It's built on, <clears throat> it's built on the type of vessel that you're operating as far as, or the type of vessels that you're operating in a string as far as in a certain trade. It's built on the utilization as far as that string. It's built on as far as how efficiently those vessels are operating. And that's being done on a round voyage basis. But not all trade lanes are the same. So there's going to be an adjustment based on a directional, a head haul and a back haul trade. Take the first two lines, so the Australia to Far East to Europe and the Far East as far as to uh, back to Australia. Go to the imbalance factor. This imbalance factor is really what is going to drive as far as the cost that's going to go into that directional voyage as far as of each one of those trades. And in this case, in this market, um, it's a heavier trade coming in from Asia as far as, uh, <clears throat> from Asia as far as to Australia. So that's going to take 1.2 times the factor as far as of the cost of that fuel versus the northbound trade, where we're generally speaking 60 to 65% utilized. Um, and that will give you, and then it's going to be the multiplied factor as far as, so take, Australia, take the Far East as far as to Australia. So the bunker consumption factor is 0.5. The, the imbalance factor is 1.2. So then we're going to be looking at a trade factor of basically 0.8. And reefer containers take another 50% as far as on top of that. So that's how we're going to be operating as far as in most of our trades. These formulas are going to be transparent. These formulas we're going to be introducing as far as to our customers, basically from this point on our new contracts. But it's a necessity as far as for carriers to do this, to basically be, to be sustainable and to be economically viable as far as in operating in all the trades they're involved in. Um, um, <clears throat> generally speaking, they're going to be monitored on a quarterly basis. Generally speaking, there could be an emergency review that if there is a swing of more than $50 as far as in the overall fuel adjustment factor, that will be passed back to the market, and, and Hembrick said probably wouldn't adjust any of our fuel adjustment factors unless we see more than a 10%, $10 swing as far as in the cost of that fuel as we introduce it. So it's going to get complicated. Not all carriers are going to be operating in the same way. Not all carriers are going to be charging this back to their customers in the same way. But it does seem to be that most carriers are going to be operating on the basis of they'll have a fuel adjustment factor, they'll have a trade factor, 
And then that will be the new bunker price that we're going to be passing on as far as our customers. Have to highlight that this is coming. All carriers, no carrier can absorb this. And this is something we've got to prepare as far as ourselves. We've got to prepare our customers for it. And we've got to prepare as far as our overall budgets to make sure that we know that these costs are coming into the industry. Maybe last, really, really quickly, um, <clears throat> a lot of the contracts for Hembrick said in the future, we'll have clausing basically from October 1 in those contracts, stating that our customers, that we do have to recognize that this will be a form that we'll be passing back as far as these fuel costs back to the customers. This isn't a pleasant, you know, this isn't a, uh, a really fun thing as far as to deliver to our customers, but it's something that's necessary that we front foot this as we go through 2019 before we hit this new charge that's coming into effect as far as in January 1, 2020. And I think I've got the hook now, right? I went over. Thank you very much. So prices are going up. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, um, very much for that detailed analysis. It's very interesting to see some of the market factors um, and the driving forces in the freight industry, um, as well the link to oil prices. So very interesting. Thank you, Jeff. Up next, we have Andrew Crawford. Andrew is currently working for one of the industry's leading associations, the Freight and Trade Alliance, in the role Head of Border and Biosecurity. Today, Andrew is here to talk about the BMSB, the brown marmigated stink bug, that bug I'm sure you all hear about and don't want to hear about much more, but it's a very important one today. Um, so we welcome, we welcome Andrew um, to talk about the stink bugs and how it has affected and continues to affect Australian imports in the past six months and the outlook. Thank you. We've just got a short video as well to start with. Join the bug hunt. It's summer and it's fruit season. Beautiful produce is grown here for us Aussies to eat and for export. But imagine a bug that can ruin all this. The brown marmorated stink bug. It eats, sucks and spoils our grapes, apples, corn, tomatoes and stone fruit, destroying industry and our home veggie patches too. So let's avoid a bug nightmare. Over winter, they invade and multiply. No bug spray will kill them, and if you squish them, they're just gonna smell like a pair of sweaty socks. Our biosecurity team are checking luggage and containers for these unwanted hitchhikers. So please check your trees, your fruits, and your flowers for stink bugs. To identify the brown marmorated stink bug, their shape is similar to other common bugs. Like the green veggie or brown soldier bugs, the brown marmorated stink bug is bigger their unique markings include white banding on the antenna and black and white markings on their lower back. And don't forget, they really stink. So join the bug hunt. See it, catch it. Call us on 1800 084 881. Our farmers will thank you for it. Well, thank you and good morning. Uh, my name's Andrew Crawford from Freight and Trade Alliance and I welcome you all here this morning. Um, thank you to the team at Visa Global Logistics for having us to speak today. Uh, the subject we're talking about obviously is the brown mummery stink bug and as you've seen it's a horrible pest that we don't want to introduce here into Australia. Um, potentially has the impact to decimate our agricultural industry which um, for our, uh, our trade is significant so we, we certainly need to keep it out of the country. It's known to feed around on 300 different varieties of plants so we, we, it, it can do from vegetables right through to the whole agricultural scene. Um, adults can also enter the homes of people and cars, so it's not just an agricultural pest, it's an actual human pest as well. It sends off what they call an aeroallergen, which can impact on, uh, human, on the humans, uh, which can have allergic reactions to such, such events. So certainly more than just an agricultural pest. It, in um, some countries like America, it has infiltrated many, many regions and the houses have virtually have become uninhabitable. So we certainly don't want to have those sorts of things here. Uh, in Australia at the moment, this current season, so the seasons run from April to sept, uh, from September through to April, there's been 251 live detections of the bug. There's been seven post-border inspections that have found the bug. There's been three air freight um, detections of the, of the bug. And there's also been detections in the pharmaceutical trade. So one of the things that we're advocating for on behalf of our members as in, as in Visa is that we want to try and work on piggyback off the Australian Trusted Traders, Trusted Traders Scheme where there is a secure supply 
chain network put in place and we want to add the biosecurity risk to potentially those sort of initiatives. So we want to try and get a lot of the compliant trade out of the inspection regime that's currently in place. Um, out of Italy particularly, we've had um, a number of detections of goods arriving that have been infested and subsequently some of those providers in Italy have been suspended. So that suspension has, mean, has meant um, obviously retreatment here in Australia, which has come a significant cost to importers and, uh, like yourselves, and it's also put enormous stress and pressure on the treatment providers here in Australia. Um, certain companies in New South Wales particularly have actually turned cargo away for up to two weeks, which of course impacts on storage, on detention, on demarage, on delays to, to the marketplace. So it's, it's a significant uh, pest that we need to stop and treat well. Uh, the other issues that we've that we've found, of, of course, are the indirect costs, and especially around the Christmas period time when we just couldn't get goods to market, and we've we've heard a lot of complaints from industry, and there have been a lot of um, finger pointing at the department. The department fundamentally are a risk mitigator to the country, and they can't afford to allow the pest in. Their secondary concern is around the commercial side of what happens after that. So they they are very strict on that, and they've been given very little ground to importers, especially in the bulk. Um, area of imports in Australia. Uh, we have seen many, many shipments turned around and re-exported because of infestation or insufficient treatment um, from countries that are, that are impacted. So the way forward, our friends at Agriculture are running a series of sessions for the 2019-2020 season starting next week. There'll be sessions running Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth. Those sessions will highlight what is going to happen for next season at this stage and what it will allow us to do is give us enough time to prepare and make sure that we don't have the same sort of delays and imposts we had this year. At this stage, indications are we are currently at nine countries with Japan for Roro vessels. Next year we're looking at going to potentially 32 countries. Now that doesn't necessarily mean the volumes will increase threefold because a lot of the European countries that will be drawn in now are, are not significant exporters to Australia. However, volumes may increase by about 12 to 15 per cent, we think. So it's important that you work with the team at Visa, you make sure that you have the right fumigators and approved providers overseas that can treat your goods correctly so they don't have to be treated here. The other thing too is also you need to look at your supply chain to ensure that the documentation flow and the export declarations that are being provided overseas are accurate and reflect what's required here in Australia. The biggest problem we have is potentially, and I've seen it, and especially in countries um, where they don't have a high compliance on export declarations, they will declare that goods do not fall into those high risk categories. And yet when they get here in Australia where we have a strict um, in infringement notice scheme and, and the customs brokers have to report the goods correctly, they do classify them correctly and they pick up the profiles that then cause treatment at this end. And that's one of our biggest problems with um, FAK type shipments and groupage type boxes, where you think you've got a, a groupage box of all clear cargo, when it gets entered here on arrival, a broker will then pick up a classification and the whole box becomes um, subject to those same treatment conditions. So that, that's really, really important. Uh, we as FTA, um, on behalf of our members like Visa Global, have put in a submission to the Inspector General. We are wanting to work with them so we can actually help them make decisions and especially commercial decisions before policy is made. It's no good giving us policy documents once decisions have been made for us to critique because it's too little too late then. They need to understand the decisions they're making impact on importers significantly and their providers. So we are trying to get to the table to help with those decisions prior to them seeing the light of day. So we'll keep working in that regard. We're also working on a number of other issues um, as FTA on behalf of the biosecurity levy which is currently under review right now, and Paul's ally, who's one of our directors, is working on that task. And again, we are trying to find the most equitable way for that to be recovered, if it has to be recovered. So again, we've, we've got the interest of our, our members and, and their customers at, at heart there. So um, what I would suggest is that you work very closely with the team at Visa. As I said, the sessions start next week. So I'm, sh I'm, I'm hoping that the countries that they will allocate will be advertised and published next week, so you will then have an idea of where you need to set up approved arrangements overseas to take care of this risk. Um, if you have any questions, we've got a question session later, I understand. I try to make it short and sharp so we would stay on time, um, but thank you all very much for your time today.
Thank you, Andrew. Um, very interesting to hear about the the impact of the stink bugs. Um, it's a growing one. I would encourage everyone, clients, new existing perspective, please take advantage of those sessions. Um, they'll be very informative. Otherwise, please contact your customs broker at Visa Global um, and they'll be able to give you the latest legislation updates as well. Um, please make sure you take note of your questions as well, people. Um, we do ask later that if you are interested, you can ask our guest speakers a question um, during the Q&A panel. Next, we have Joanne Castle, New South Wales Coordinator of the Border Watch Program for the Department of Home Affairs. She will be talking about what piggybacking is and its telltale signs. The Border Watch Program plays a vital role in protecting Australia's border from the entry and exit of illegal and illicit goods and unauthorised people. Please join me in welcoming Joanne. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you again to Visa for having me here today. It's very much appreciated. It's not often that um, as do the Border Watch Program gets the opportunity to speak with actual companies that are importing. So it's, uh, it's very good for us to be able to spread our wings, so to speak. So we're, we're very appreciative of the opportunity. Let me get my face off there first. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, what is piggybacking? Piggybacking occurs when a, an unscrupulous entity um, uses the identifying details of a legitimate company to bring goods across the border, which uh, probably aren't that uh, great for our country here. So well, it's almost like uh, your own personal identity being used, but it's in, in uh, a company way. So a lot of the big imports that we see come through have come through like that. So what, what I'm going to do today is just run through some of the suspicious activity that you may notice, that it may cross your desk that you could look out for and report back. Um, in saying that, like we do do a lot of uh, work with our industry partners, freight forwarders, customs brokers, transport companies, courier drivers. So we're working with them as well. But if at the end, if I have time, I can go over a little case study where an actual importer did come across it. So if you receive an inquiry from another broker or another freight forwarder about a shipment, most of you would most of you would have obviously if you have Visa <laughs> as your uh, as your your brokerage, your freight forwardage. If all of a sudden you get a query out of the blue from another company, that would possibly indicate that it could be somebody piggybacking. So they've gone to another broker to facilitate the movement of the goods and then they'll make an inquiry to you to see if it is the company. When they, if you do receive any paperwork, if the email address that you receive on that paperwork has been altered in any way, that is a huge indicator. So what they'll do is, so an example would be, I'll use my name, you know, I might be a carpet importer. So it might be Joe's Carpets at um, castleimports.com.au. But they'll change it to maybe at um, Joe's Carpets at um, Joanne Castle underscore. You know, they might put a little underscore. They might put a dot in between something, which changes the whole domain of any correspondence that goes. So you're cut right out of the loop. So to, to your freight forwarder, if, say, they're using a legitimate freight forwarder, of course, they're not going to notice that because they're going to look and go, oh, yeah, it's at, it looks right. But they've just changed it slightly to send that, that correspondence away somewhere else. If you receive any unusual delivery re address requests, you might always get your delivery sent to your warehouse at, you know, 17 Smith Street. But then all of a sudden you've got another facility somewhere else and all of this container is going to be delivered there. It's just they haven't done their homework properly. So they haven't realised that that's not where you normally take those deliveries and then they possibly will go in and change the delivery address after customs clearance, which is illegal, but it doesn't mean they don't do it. So um, the little things like that. Um, if you notice some unusual activity on your BAS statement, and we have had incidents like this where people will call us so obviously it's happened down way past in the past, but uh, when they're going through, they notice the shipment that they didn't they didn't import. If that does happen to you, we would still be interested in hearing about that. Um, even though yes, obviously it's long gone, the information will still be valuable. It, you know, it could be a small missing piece of a jigsaw puzzle that we're trying to piece together for something. If there's an unusual shipping route that you wouldn't normally have your goods shipped, um, sometimes. They'll, like it's probably not cost effective for something to go into Brisbane and road it down to Sydney when there was a ship that was coming into Sydney that they could have put it on. So they sometimes try and 
mix things up a bit to get it. And if they think that maybe Brisbane will clear it quicker, less cargo goes into Brisbane, I can get this container cleared quicker, I can get my stuff out of it, gone. When you do get your goods, if, they, if, if you've noticed that there's been any damage or if they've been modified or tampered with in any way, that could possibly mean that that consignment has been, the, the, the bad part of the consignment has been taken out en route to the, the, the delivery address. Um, if when you, again, when you receive them, if there's incorrect information on them, things aren't matching up with your records. Um, when they do tend to do this piggyback scenario, they're not going to know 100% everything about the way you conduct your business. So there might be something missing in that that doesn't match up with what you do. It's not reconciling with your, your records. If you've had a, any incidents of the being unaccounted um, in transit or to your business address, we did have a report of this some years ago where the container went missing, the seal number wasn't matching on the records that they received. We sent a team out to unlock the container because the company didn't want to open it without any, with us having a presence there and there was visible signs of entry into that container. So where that happened, we would never be able to pinpoint. It might have happened on the ship, it could have happened on the road, it could have happened anywhere. It could have happened at um, loading port. So. Um, if you notice that any of your goods have been opened, like it sounds far-fetched, but if you take delivery of goods and there's a box open and it's not quite full, that's definitely something that we would like to know about as well. I've just put this um, in here and it's part of the, the work we do with Trusted Trader and it's a seven-point container inspection. So a lot of companies are taking this on board now. So when they're, um, they're unpacking, un, unpacking, unpacking <laughs> their containers, they will get their workers to do this, it's fairly quick, seven-point check. Because it's not just the goods within the container that can be used for, to bring in um, drugs and illicit goods, it can be the actual container itself. So there, there's been cases where the, um, there'll be concealments in the rivets, is that what you call them? The yeah, that. I'm not up with my con container terminology. In all those bits and pieces in a container that you could put things in, then they'll do it. They will build false bottoms. So if you notice that a container possibly had um, a visible false bottom on it, uh, also in the refrigeration compartment, we've had concealments in refrigeration compartments of reefers as well. So anything that they can do, they will use and they will bring the drugs in here. Uh, the, I'll just give you a quick case study. I think I've got time, haven't I? Yep. Yeah. How much time have I got so I know how to talk? Oh, I'm fast. Did I talk too fast? Okay. Um, an example of a piggyback scenario that we did have was probably about, uh, and I'm using this as an example, it's happening all the time. But this particular one occurred about two years ago. It was a, a business that had a legitimate importing history. They imported from European countries. Um, been in business for a substantial amount of time. One day out of the blue, they got a call from a, a freight forwarder who wasn't their normal freight forwarder. They obviously used one and didn't deviate from that. They said, oh, no, they had checked. We haven't imported anything from there at all. Uh, no, we don't import from that particular country, even though the goods and everything was exactly what they imported. So someone had done a fair bit of homework on them. So... Um, we're thinking, uh, uh, to be honest with you, at this point of time, it was actually the business that called me because the, he, they got sent the paperwork, they went through it. There was the email address that we, I spoke about previously. They had changed the email address so slightly that, that it wasn't picked up. This company then went into a little bit of a, a little mini meltdown because they thought that they'd been infiltrated as such and, and what happened to their IT? What, why didn't it get picked up? But it was just a simple thing that they'd done to, to move that domain away. There was no, no, one, no suggestion that the company had, had a part in this at all. I then received a call from the freight forwarder just as well because I would have been a bit upset if they didn't call. That's, uh, that's what we do, get our message out to them. So we had the information from two parties. Put an examination in place and there was 360 kilograms of methamphetamine in that shipment. And that's just one example. 
you know, I could probably give you numerous ones that continually over and over of, of this scenario taking place. They'll even use big companies. Woolworths, for example, they'll use them. It's no one's no one's exempt from it. So I guess the basic the basic thing we ask is just to keep your eye out for things that don't seem right. I know when I've done this talk before, people will say, "Yeah, I had a funny call once from someone asking me about a shipment, but it wasn't our shipment, so I you know didn't think anything of it." Yeah, it wasn't your shipment, but someone was was shipping something in under your name. And it's very, very common in the tobacco to bring tobacco in. We'll see, you know, full containers of tobacco coming in that way. Uh, the Border Watch number, it's a 24-hour number that we that we have, 1800 one 1800 It's specifically for our industry members. We uh, don't allow any other calls through it and you actually do get answered by a person. There's no pressing buttons or anything like that. And as I say, it's a 24-hour number. So if you do ever come across anything, you, uh, don't ever hesitate to call us. Don't think that it's not enough information that you have. Anything that you can provide is more than... We're more than happy to take it. You'd be surprised what little information we've received. We've got our analysts to work up and have got big detections out of it. So it's it's all worthwhile. So I think that's about it. How am I going? Do you want me to dance? I'm gonna <laughs> do a little song or a dance or something. But, um, I think that's about it from me. But you know, later on, if there's any questions, more than happy to to answer them. So thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Um, next, please join me in welcoming Mark Hulme to the stage. Mark is the COO of Logistics at DP World Australia. DP World Australia is the nation's biggest port and supply chain operator. Mark will be talking about the role of the ports in the supply chain and tips on how to avoid storage charges. Please help me in welcoming Mark. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the Visa team. Uh, that was a former role that I had, right, as, as uh, Chief Operating Officer of Logistics. I'm now the General Manager running uh, DP World Sydney Container Terminal. Who DP World are, many will know. So we're Australia's largest stevedore. Uh, our market share nationally is about 45%. We have our operations in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Fremantle uh, and approximately 2,100 staff nationally. DP World globally, so we're the third largest stevedore. 78 businesses in 40 countries employing over 45,000 people and we handle about 174,000 containers every day globally. Improving the interface with stevedores. We've heard some, uh, I guess, some uh, cost increases that might be coming to the industry. I'm going to try and offer you a solution to take some cost out of your supply chain. Documentation right, is a key one for removing cost out of your supply chain. So the process uh, when a container is um, loaded or moving from the port of origin to the port of destination, that information is known weeks in advance of when the container turns up in the port of such as Sydney. Um, containers spend many days on the water as they come down. What we're finding is greater than 22% of containers, when they're discharged from a vessel, are not cleared. And that could be a customs hold, it could be a quarantine hold, it could be an import duty that hasn't been paid. That's not a real concern to the stevedore. As long as the container is cleared by the time a truck turns up to take delivery of the container, there's, there's no concern from our perspective. What we do find, though, is the number of containers that aren't cleared when a time slot has been booked, and therefore the transport company such as Visa would get a, a no-show or they'll get a wrong zone or we will refuse to service that truck because there's not a clearance that's come through. And that's either a customs clearance or it could be um, an EIDO that hasn't come through because the shipping line freight's not been paid. So as I said, these, these don't impact us but they definitely impact your carrier. And those costs are passed on what, to you as, as their customers. They're costs that can be avoided by the early supply of documentation. When as importers you want to pay your import duty or pay your shipping line fees is absolutely up to you. And many do it at the last minute, obviously from a cash flow perspective. But from our perspective, getting that early documentation, we can work with uh, Visa in particular to making sure that we can, we can drive the effective delivery of that container out right, across the 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Storage charges. They've been a bane of the industry for many years and I, I know uh, a number of people in the room would say that as stevedores we charge too high. We have significant costs in terms of our rent. We offer a three free day storage period on import containers. 
I look at the industry and, and it'll be on YouTube. We don't want the revenue. We would much uh, more happily see the containers leave the terminal in an efficient manner. It means we can adjust our, our equipment, our labour, our resourcing, but more importantly, it gains capacity for us as a Steve at all. So we provide the three free days. Right? Beyond the three free days, there are escalating charges with regard to import storage. Right? For us, it, as I said, it drives the efficient movement of containers. Uh, through the facility. That early documentation, what right, coupled with the early advice to your carrier, getting those containers out, right, is a sure way to avoid those import storage charges. You can still book a time slot, or your transport company, Visa can book a transport, sorry, can book a time slot, even though there is a hold on that uh, container. As long as those holds are lifted prior to the truck turning up, right, you can avoid those import storage charges. Um, the impact if, uh, if there is a hold that's not released and you miss a slot, we will not provide a slot in the next hour right, or in, in two hours beyond that. It is more likely going to be 24 to 48 hours beyond that time before that container can be rebooked, by which stage there will be significant charges that are then uh, imposed, I, I guess, upon the carrier and therefore you as the customer. So that early documentation, the early communication with Visa would definitely help reduce your operating costs. Um, Neil will probably spend a little bit more time on this uh, later in terms of empty container management. Majority of empty container parks don't operate 24-7 operations. Container stevedores do. As DP World, uh, we un obviously understand the demands that are there for um, Visa and other operators in terms of trying to return empty containers after they've been de-stuffed. We offer a direct empty return arrangement with a number of the larger shipping lines. That allows a Visa to re-deliver that container directly to us after it's been unpacked. Um, often transport companies running, uh, I guess, high performance vehicles will put multiple containers on a, on a truck. So if you happen to have a Hamburg Sud container on there with a 00 CL container, and it was destined to go back to DP World Logistics as an example, um, Neil will probably touch on it, there are more redirections that are applied in Sydney than there are any other uh, state in the country. What happens when the truck gets close, those redirections can be put on with a minute's notice. Visa will turn up at one of the empty container parks and be unable to drop off one of those containers and have to be redirected somewhere else. That container park may not be open. So they have the, the double cost of handling it. There's additional charges from their perspective. Working with Visa, and Visa are the largest that use the direct empty returns into DP World, and we're aware that obviously the other Steve Wills have the same. They can pair those containers up Right, drop them into our facility 24-7 and then pair it up with their import time slot to take delivery of those. There's a fee that's attached to it, right, but that's something we work through with Visa. But, but it avoids some of those additional costs that come from redirecting empties and we're seeing it more and more. And as I said, Neil will probably touch on that uh, on later on. That's it. I'll try to stay within the 10 minutes. Thank you, Mark. Up next, I would like to call up Neil Chambers. Neil is the director of the Container Transport Alliance Australia, CTAA, a strong commercial industry alliance organisation dedicated to the container transport logistics industry in Australia. Neil is well within the industry and government circles for his advice and advocacy on commercial, regulatory and industrial issues impacting the future productivity, safety and viability of the freight industry. Today, Neil will be, Neil will be talking about Sydney's empty container management issue. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks very much to Visa for inviting me to come along. Again, like uh, FTA, Visa is a very strong alliance company of CTAA, and we, we work with Visa around the country, uh, particularly around the land side interfaces. Uh, and so that's what I'll talk about. It was a great segue from uh, Mark in terms of what I want to talk about today, which is empty container management. So they say that a port is only as good, a container port is only as good as its empty container management. And if we're using that as a measure uh, here in, in Sydney, uh, in New South Wales, in Port Botany, we're not doing all that well at the moment. And it's uh, adding uh, significant cost into the landside logistics chain. Um, so l let's go to a boring graph to start off with. Um, Port Botany TU forecast. So I've pulled this from NSW Ports, the the port operator, um, and it's the dark grey bit in that uh, bar um, uh, graph that you need to concentrate on in relation to uh, to empties. Um, 
uh, Port Botany is effectively an import port, um, uh, smaller volumes of, of export compared to other ports around the country like uh, Melbourne, for example. So our biggest export out of, uh, out of Port Botany is fresh air, fresh air in containers. So last year it was about 670,000 TEUs uh, that were uh, repatriated or repoed overseas uh, by the shipping line. So it is our biggest export commodity and um, we've got to do a little bit better in terms of management. So you think about 670,000 TEU, again, uh, looking forward to 2035, 2045, we're getting upwards of 2.9 million TEU uh, in empties that need to be handled. So if we can't get the productivity and the, and the efficiency right in terms of um, empty container management now, we're really facing a, a, an uphill battle uh, into the future. So what's going on? Well, Mark uh, touched on it uh, briefly in his presentation. We've got a couple of things happening at the moment. As far as empty container management capacity in Port Botany, uh, we've got a, a, a reduction that's gone on. Some cube uh, uh, closed some facilities. Um, uh, we have uh, empty container opening hours. Uh, we've got some of the, uh, uh, the, em the empties being directed to particular empty container parks, and that's a that's a call of the shipping line, uh, if you like, uh, to, to direct the containers back to a particular facility. And where that's happening, um, gate capacity of those, uh, those operations, uh, particularly during peak times, but also throughout their whole uh, opening hours, is something that we need to consider. Um, so two of the biggest parks here, as far as the directions are concerned, are um, MCS at, uh, at St Peter's and, um, uh, and DP World Logistics in, in Botany Road. Um, so MCS, for example, will do anywhere between 1,000 to 1,500 TU exchange per day. That's the, the largest container park in Australia as far as volume is concerned. Um, so we're, we're, we've got a gate capacity issue, particularly for those parks where the, the volumes are being directed uh, to those parks. There's been this reduction. There is some issues around opening hours. Um, and as uh, Mark mentioned, uh, direct return to wharf. Direct return to wharf works well here in this port. Uh, where it doesn't work well is when Mark uh, runs out of capacity and the pool closes. So Mark allocates a certain amount of uh, space within his terminal to take empties back. If the shipping lines aren't repatriating those boxes quick enough from Mark's terminal, you become congested, there's not enough space left in the, in the, in the facility and that's closed off. Uh, and when that happens, of course, they've got to be directed somewhere else and that's when Visa Global and others have problems from a transport uh, company point of view. Again, Mark mentioned redirections. This is the redirection capital of the world here in Sydney. Uh, there's at least 50 different redirections in the system at any one time uh, in Sydney at the moment. That's vastly more than any of the other ports. Uh, even the largest container port in Australia, Melbourne, has, I would say, a, about a third of the redirection levels. Why is it happening in Sydney? Well, one thing, the reason why is that the shipping lines, and it is the shipping lines equipment, so this is not necessarily having a go at the shipping lines, they want to get the boxes back where they want to have it for the next use, uh, whether that's repatriation overseas or in this uh, state particularly, redirection to the rail so that they can be turned around, put on a train and sent into regional New South Wales for, for export. Um, so clearly the shipping lines, as Jeff said, they're trying to save a dollar, that's understandable. So instead of them going back to a traditional empty container park and then the shipping line being responsible for the cost of either getting it to the ship side or taking it to the railhead, they're uh, trying to, where possible, make sure that the transport operator like Visa Global is doing that on their behalf and paying for it. And, and you're, as customers, you, you pay for it um, directly. One of the difficulties with these redirections and something we need to talk to the shipping lines about and also uh, uh, the empty container park operators is that, and Mark mentioned it, the redirection can be put on with no notice. In fact, the truck can be in the queue for the empty container park facility that the shipping line has directed the box back to, only to be told when they get to the head of the queue, sorry mate, there's a redirection on on those, go away, and so you've got a futile truck trip, who pays for that? Um, we would actually say that we need notice 
of the redirections. I would say at least 12 hours notice. Uh, it happens in other ports, so the shipping lines can do it. They can forecast better and give some notice. Uh, and also if there's um, existing what we call notifications in the container chain system for people who understand con the container chain empty container management system. If there's a valid notification, so Scotty's got a, a truck arriving uh, in that facility and the facility knows about it because they have it on their pending movement screen, well, honour, honour that notification, even if the redirection's been put on. If we had some of those sorts of rules to live by, uh, I think we'd um, take a lot of heat out of the issues. Uh, the other big one, and this is a, a nationwide problem, uh, but it's, it's, it's worse in Sydney than some other ports, close to 40% of the empty container movements in Sydney don't have any electronic data provided by the shipping line. You might say, well, what does that mean? Well, when Scott's uh, fleet allocators go into the system to say, I've got container ABCD, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it's been directed back to a particular park, I'll go into the container chain system, put in the information, put in the container number. If there's electronic information that the shipping line has provided into the system, it'll pre-populate um, the screen with all of the data around that container. All the fleet allocator has to do is make a notification for the truck arrival and away you go. If there's no EDI, then poor Scott's uh, fleet allocators have to put all this information in, but worse still, the driver has to have some identification that they can show to the empty container park that that box is actually destined to go back to that facility. Now in the bad old days, we're starting to improve this, that meant a piece of paper. It's the 21st century and we're still carrying pieces of paper around. Nowadays it might be a facsimile copy, uh, um, uh, something on the, the driver's uh, um, a smart device uh, in the truck that's all good, but still the operational intervention that has to occur at the empty container park between the driver and the operational staff slows down the gate processing times. So what we want to try and get to is a point where the, tr the truck driver doesn't need to talk to anybody. The system is, is uh, fully automated and in fact uh, in other states in Australia I've seen 30 second truck turnaround times in empty container parks where uh, all of the EDIs in the, in, the, in, the, in the system and the driver is immediately allocated to the fork operating area and, and away we go. So this is a real problem. Um, I could name the companies. There are a few recalcitrant shipping lines that have just never wanted to provide this information and hell, let's do it. Double OCL. <laughs> okay. Evergreen. And believe it or not, ANL. CGM CMA is a big one in this, in, this, uh, in, in this state. Don't know why, but that's the case. So as customers, as transport operators, as organisations like CTAA, we've got to try and improve this with the shipping lines particularly that aren't, aren't providing the information. And what it does is it holds us back, as I said, from this paperless gate entry. We really want to get to a point where we can speed up the velocity of the movement through these, through these facilities. And so what does it mean uh, for a, a, an organisation like Visa and the other transport operators? Well, it is significant. It might seem a bit hidden to you from a, from a customer point of view, but you look out there and in the yard, probably about a third of the boxes out there are empties that Scotty's trying to, to organise to get back or reuse or do some smart things so that it's not costing him a lot of money. But it could be anywhere between 90 to 200 bucks a, t a, a, a container, $200 a container, in additional costs. Uh, you know, particularly if you get futile truck trips, there might be queuing delays in the facilities. You've got added um, added truck kilometres. Uh, you might not, you, you might have to get a box back because it's going to go into container detention. So the truck utilisation is not very good because Scott's got to, you know, get those boxes back immediately. So there's a whole bunch of things and staging and staging the staging costs back through the yard. If he's got to bring it back into a yard to then subsequently take it to an empty container park, it costs money, okay? So that's when we want to try and reduce this, we don't want the transport operators to have to pass that cost on to you. 
but it, it's unsustainable as, as it's currently standing. That's me. Thanks very much. Thank you, Neil. Um, very interesting take on the industry. Um, some of you might have seen some of the CTAA announcements we send out via email, which are really helpful. So we'll continue to do that and keep you informed of, of empty container issues and rising costs as well. Next, we have our very own Scott Walker. Um, please stay on stage, Scott, after because we do have the Q&A. Um, and Scott, ladies and gentlemen, is our national transport manager on the commercial side of our business. He's our in-house truck geek and Innovator, self-proclaimed innovator. No, Scott is an innovator um, with a lot of the trailers um, and the heavy axles that Visa trucks have to carry those heavy boxes. Scott has been in container tr in the container transport industry for 25 years. Um, he will be talking about the transport challenges at Visa, its effect on customers such as yourselves, and how we're tackling these challenges. Please welcome Scott. Thank you, James, I think. Um, I'll try not to get too much geek on. As uh, James mentioned, I've been in the container transport industry for 25 years, almost 10 years now with Visa. Um, within those first years of working in the transport industry, there was quite a lot of things that happened back in that, that time. Things have changed a lot now. I remember the Patrick strikes in late 90s. A lot of you in the room might remember the strikes. Um, I still recall photos of people with children um, blockading the ports. Not long after that, I was part of the Port Botany Landside Improvement Strategy, which is a set of legislation which governs stevedores and transport companies and how we operate. We must operate at a certain level of KPI um, or there's large penalties that we are uh, faced with both the port and the transport company. Prior to these moments in the industry, it wasn't unusual to experience a five hour delay to go and pick up one container at the port. So fast forward now 10, 15 years and things have changed in today's environment. On a positive note, transport carriers now rarely spend more than an hour at the port. Often the stats show that it's around 30 minutes. There's a plug for you, Mark. Whilst there is always room for improvement, on a positive note, um, the stevedores and transport companies are doing really well together. The local supply chain and factors include the following. We need to now look at the entire supply chain rather than just focusing on the stevedore and transport company relationships. The factors that go into the entire supply chain are as follows. Shipping lines, stevedores, transport companies, Sydney's congestion and traffic issues, weather events, distribution centres, and of course, empty container parks. Throw a stink bug in the mix and you really mess things up. So what are the issues and main challenges today? Firstly, shipping lines, detention terms, empty container redirections, which Neil's talked about, empty container evacuations, EIDO transfers, which Neil's also mentioned. For Visa, we've been paperless in a truck for five years. We're using tablet devices for compliance. We need to drive a truck back into a Visa site to go and dehire an empty if the delivery order hasn't been provided electronically. In this day and age, at less than 50% being provided, it's wrong. Sydney's congestion. Roads have never been worse. One traffic incident affects the entire network. Weather events, often impacting ports, intermodal terminals, roads, and empty container parks. DC receiving behaviour, standard delivery requirements between 6am and 11am, forces trucks to battle peak hour traffic and struggle to make our delivery slots. We need to consider options to spread this to other times, looking at other times of the day and night. This will reduce congestion and emission on our roads and facilitate on-time delivery and better, better labour management for DCs. Sydney empty parks. Neil's already spoken about it. There is a declining capacity for empties. More needs to be done with shipping lines and the government. Empty park operating hours are a big issue. We're forced to work 24-7. The stevedores work 24-7. There are empty container parks in Sydney that operate 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Often by 8 a.m. in the morning, there's no more slots we can get that day. What are we doing at Visa to tackle these industry challenges? 
Firstly, stink bugs. As covered by Andrew in his presentation, the stink bug problem has been very disruptive and costly for Australian importers. Visa is now well placed by installing two fumigation pads at both Banks Meadow and Erskine Park. This complements our other fumigation facilities in both Brisbane and Melbourne. We have an open discussion with clients to change DC behaviour. We now deliver over 50% of containers outside that peak period of 6am to 11am, reducing our footprint on Sydney's roads. We lobby, lobby both New South Wales ports and transport for New South Wales. The legislation that we created 10 to 15 years ago needs to include the entire supply chain and not just focus on stevedores and transport companies. We do direct negotiations with shipping lines. We try to avoid the use of empty container parks by use, doing reuse or triangulation. The opening of this amazing um, Erskine Park facility has been a big win for us. Our on-time delivery KPIs have been a real winner since we've opened this facility. We have a lot to do and we'll continue to work on a better supply chain for you all. If you have any questions, I'll be part of the Q&A shortly. So thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Um, if I could get all our speakers, please, to come up to these stools and we'll begin our Q&A panel. The way we're going to run this is we actually have some pre-done questions um, from our guests, yourselves, who have RSVP'd about key industry issues, um, which I'll direct to certain speakers. However, um, speakers, I'd encourage you, you to jump in um, and, you know, let's just keep it quite informative um, and obviously you know, interactive. Feel free to jump in with each other and answer um, the questions that we've got here and as well of the audience. And I'll come around with a microphone and just ask some of you if you want to ask a specific question and I'll bring you the microphone and you can ask that to our panel members here. Just Hello. Okay, um, the first question we've got here, um, and panellists listed to respond, it can be anyone. However, here I've got this question more central to, to Jeff, Mark, Neil and Scott. Question number one, um, what is the way forward with Sydney's empty container situation? Uh, we did touch on that briefly from Neil. However, um, <coughs> that is our qu first question. There is a disjoint in the supply chain and importers are paying the price. What are the shipping carriers, ports and visa doing about this problem? Um, if I could get Scott, please, to answer first and then you can go from there. Um, I think, the one, we need more capacity. I think touching on in my talk then is about the legislation. Um, there is a gaping hole. The supply chain between transport carriers and stevedores is world's best. Um, we legislated it 15 years ago. Unfortunately, the legislation process, which we have been pushing now for some time um, as a part of the cargo facilitation committees that we are a part of, um, it does take a lot of time and there, now there's a whole lot more stakeholders in place. So it is going to take time, but we are hoping that that legislation comes into place where a supply chain is now operating 24-7. Um, we're an international city, the empty parks need to do the same and we do even suggest that the shipping lines um, need to come into that legislation as well. You know, we need to have a fair playing field for all and not the focus just on the, at times, transport company or the stevedore. Thanks, Scott. I guess also it'd be interesting to hear from yourself, Jeff, you know, from the shipping line side. <clears throat> Look, um, <clears throat> one, I'm really glad that we dodged the bullet when Neil named and shamed. <laughs> but <clears throat> but I, think, I think it is about naming and shaming because not all carriers are equal and so, um, so some carriers have a, have a large amount of redirection. A lot of that redirection is based on poor planning. It's based on poor empty evacuation as far as out of, the, uh, out of the terminals, out of the depots. It's based on poor planning in terms of where you want your stocks to be as far as for empty release for export cargoes. Um, carriers have got to lift their game, um, you know, without trying to offer a big sales pitch to this room. That we plan accurately, we have EDI coverage as far as with uh, basically all of our, all of our uh, providers and partners. Um, we book our Northeast Asian vessels only to 60% capacity with full cargo because we know we need 40% of that ship and our capacity on that ship to evacuate the empties as far as to cut the congestion as far as in the terminals and also the depots. 
if carriers are not performing, um, keep a scorecard, keep KPIs, monitor as far as what carriers are offering the redirections or forcing redirections, and what carriers are not evacuating their boxes out, and what carriers don't have their EDI connections. In this day and age, there's no excuse as far as for a shipping company not to have an electronic interface with their service providers. Can I, can I just say that as, as far as Scott's correct, I mean, the, the government's wanting to take an interest here, so Transport for New South Wales is going to do a, a study so that they understand and can provide some advice to the Minister around <coughs> empty container management. But the wheels of the bureaucracy move pretty slowly. So I, I, I'm of the view that industry needs to have its own conversations. And in fact, this afternoon, we've got uh, a whole bunch of road transport operators coming together with the two big uh, uh, container parks, MCS and, and uh, DP World Logistics, to have, have some of those conversations in conjunction with the major technology container chain. Uh, and I think there's some things we can do together but it is going to rely, as Jeff just said, on, on the shipping lines wanting to come along for the ride as well. We might actually get you guys as customers, as shippers eventually, to help us out in this regard because the shipping lines will listen to you more than they will listen to four old transport operators. Um, and, you know, again, I, I might name and shame. I've, I've had conversations with the Managing Director of OCL, Eddie De Klerk. Eddie, why can't you provide uh, the EDI information? Why can't you pro provide the electronic information? Oh, Neil, you know, it's about number 100 on the list of things to do. It's all going to come out of Hong Kong. You know, woe is me. Uh, they, they just don't see it as something that they need to do because they don't think it impacts on you, their customers. And it does. So you need to tell them that they need to improve. That Jeez, I, want to stand, I want to stay on your good side. I'd like to stay on your good side. I'll just add too, the electronic data interface is supplied 100% to every stevedore. So the technology is in the shipping lines to provide it, they just choose not to. As a stevedore, and, and we operate obviously empty container parks, I disagree with Scott on one point. I don't think regulation helps. And if we're waiting on the government to try and fix this <coughs> for us, I think we're going to be waiting a long time. Totally and agree. there's some upsides and some downsides of regulation. From our perspective, I agree with Neil, it's got to be a conversation that, that there's all industry players in there. We, you can pay more for parking <coughs> in a city for two hours than, than an empty container, uh, sorry, an empty depot gets for a container for a month sitting in a park. So there's a conversation about everyone in the supply chain getting together to come up with a solution, and that involves transport operators, empty container parks, sleeve doors, and shipping lines. Absolutely. But pressure coming from importers and exporters would definitely help that conversation. Um, second question, are there any new and upcoming freight related charges we should be aware of? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joking. <coughs> Let's deal with the ones we've currently got. Uh, infrastructure charges, um, let's talk about that, sorry, no, go for it. Um, as people know, the, the, the stevedores have put massive increases in these landside logistics uh, or, or infrastructure surcharges. Um, <coughs> You know, our view is that uh, there's a rebalancing going on. If you read the ACCC report, monitoring report, if, if anyone's really interested in that, it might put you to sleep at night, but it's got some really good stats in there. You know, the shipping lines are, are benefiting from better stevedoring rates with the stevedores. There's more competition, particularly on the East Coast. So Mark or DP World have to compete with Patrick, have to compete with Hutchison here in in Brisbane and Sydney and, and, and also uh, VICT, Victoria International Container Terminal in, in Melbourne. So there's more competition for stevedoring that's naturally driving down prices. Uh, the, sh the shipping lines are benefiting that. The stevedores want to in in increase their margin or make sure their margins are healthy so they put these infrastructure surcharges on. But the big thing that governments need to understand and you need to push back on are the shipping lines passing on any of those savings that they're getting from better stevedoring rates? Are you seeing your terminal handling charges come down? I see lots of you <laughs> shaking your heads. <laughs> Why is that? So who's winning? Who are the winners and the losers? The shipping lines are winning big time. And you well. need to push back. <laughs> that didn't last long. Oh, I'll duck. I liked him before. <laughs> like I think, I think it's natural when you see a lot of consolidation in the industries, and you see carriers like Costco, Double OCL, as far as forming together. You see Hembrickson and Merce joining together. 
which are two, you know, we're both uh, two pretty large carriers as far as in this trade, you're going to use your consolidated volumes as far as into negotiation as far as with your service providers. That's a natural, but don't think that <clears throat> carriers have been unprofitable for the last eight or 10 years. Carriers need to make a better return to our shareholders. Carriers need to make a better return as far as to build containers to build ships. And so if carriers aren't passing on some of these cost savings that we've been able to achieve, we're at least trying to get into a black zero or above the line in terms of profitability, which we haven't done over the last eight to 10 years. So kind of guilty as charged. Yes, we're trying to make some more money in terms of doing what we're doing, but we're also trying to survive and be sustainable in, do, in doing what we do. Um, I, I think the challenge for the, for the stevedoring side of the business is that you are dealing with much larger carrier groupings. And you are dealing with much larger carrier groupings that are going through very, very detailed procurement processes by talking to different operators as we're doing with different depots as far as to try and get the most effective, um, cost efficient, and service capabilities that we can. And I, I don't feel guilty about that. But from a Steve Orr's perspective, uh, the infrastructure charges initially came in well, on the back of port privatisation. Now, if, I, if I look at Brisbane, <coughs> it was a 790% increase in the rent that we paid over the period of three years. Well, um, less so uh, in more recent times that the infrastructure increases. Um, Guess right, we're seeing vessel upsizes. So in the past where we had shipped ashore cranes that we would get 20 or 25 years life out of, with the upsizing of vessels to 8,000, 10,000 and beyond, we're having to scrap cranes at 12 years or 15 years. Far, far shorter than what the original lifestyle, you know, life cycle was on those, those assets. From a deep world perspective, um, I can't comment on the other Steve other than to say they haven't invested the same as we have. We've invested $180 million in the last 18 months in new ship to shore cranes, in new equipment in straddles, uh, in rail upgrades, in forklifts, uh, in empty container uh, handling equipment. And, and that investment, you're right, we, we need to get a return for our shareholders. And that is a cost that, unfortunately, we've had to pass on what, to, uh, I guess, users of our facility mm -hmm. that goes by the transport industry, what, to the ultimate to the importers and exports. Yeah. I'd say pass it back to your clients, uh, Mark, but I, I understand what you're saying. In most businesses, you charge your client, not someone else. The transport the industry is a client of, of the stevedores. Our, our, our clients are not just the shipping lines. If I can just add, the, the, the problem I have with it is traditionally your port charges and your freight rates were negotiated with your visas and um, your handbooks or whoever it may be. And once you got a price that was all inclusive of your price, you could negotiate with your shipping line around that price because you were getting a service for that. What I'm seeing now is these infrastructure fees coming in, the transport operator doesn't hold that contract with the term with the stevedore. They have no way to negotiate a rate and they don't know what that rate's going to be at the time of shipment. Okay, interesting. Um, look, it's it's clear that between I guess alliances, transport alliances like people like Neil from CTAA, forders like Visa, shipping lines and, and DP, there needs to be some ongoing collaboration in, in twenty nineteen into the future. Um, you know, we've just had an election in New South Wales. <coughs> Whether or not the impact of regulation is going to be effective, um, I think, yeah, there's definitely got to be some more collaboration, as I think most of our customers here will agree and suppliers. Next question is a bit of a different pace um, on the subject of stink bugs and, and fumigation. So, Andrew, this is probably one for you as well. Um, methyl bromide, the gas um, to treat fumigated containers, it's a fast acting fumigant used in Australia. However, it is banned in the EU for toxicity concerns um, as well as safety concerns for people coming into contact with that gas. I suppose the big question is why is that still legal in Australia and banned in, in Europe and what's the outlook for that treatment method? Yeah, I suppose that comes down to Australia's desire to keep the pest disease out. So without the, without the use of such chemicals, sulfuryl fluoride, methyl bromide and, and heat treatment, there's no other way of um, stopping BMSB and other type pests from infiltrating Australia. Uh, one of the problems that we had this season is our friends at Agriculture decided again midway through the season that their officers didn't have the correct testing equipment for sulfuryl fluoride, which caused enormous delays again and the inability for certain containers to be unpacked and treated during those periods of times. So that's a real frustration when they announce a chemical that they will accept and yet when it gets here that all of a sudden their officers deem they don't have the right equipment to test such chemicals. So um, as we know in Europe, it, it is banned in a lot of places, methyl bromide particularly. Um, in Italy, sulfuryl fluoride is, is quite readily used. Um, 
We have had in previous seasons, Italian providers providing false and misleading documentation, saying they had actually treated goods with sulfur fluoride, only to find out at this end that they weren't even um, available to the chemical. It's quite registered in Italy, and so I knew exactly who had the chemical, and people that were providing treatments didn't even have the chemical. So these are some of the problems that agriculture have in ensuring this disease doesn't get in here. So, I guess um, another question to that, you know, the stink bug you mentioned, they're going to be adding a few more countries um, around the world next year after the, the finishing of the season coming up. Um, Infrastructure-wise, particularly in Sydney, where do you see that going in terms of local infrastructure being able to handle the volumes that we anticipate to grow? Um, you know, Visa, we've adapted effectively to that as a business with, with fumigation on site here in Erskine Park and Banks Meadow, but, you know, more for the industry, I guess, is a big question on how do you see that? Developing. So, so what, what we're pushing for as an industry representation is that um, a lot of the brokers within Visa are highly qualified, skilled and accredited in quarantine matters. 1.1, 1.3 quarantine facilities have staff in place that have been trained in certain areas of methyl bromide treatment, whatever it may be. There's no reason why those low level inspections can't be done on site of premises like this and take the pressure off the, the, the department people to actually conduct those. The other areas we're looking at is potentially the removal of seals intact type inspections. Um, the amount of throughput you can do under those conditions is, is just ridiculous and we just can't keep up with the demand. Uh, we've also seen other demands where, as I said before, certain fumigators have closed their doors for up to two weeks because they just couldn't handle volume. And the other thing is we didn't have a heat treatment provider in New South Wales. Now I understand that there will be one announced shortly, which at least will give you an option if methyl bromide and sulfur fluoride is not an adequate treatment for your, your goods. Can I maybe jump in there too? Yeah. That, uh, I think it's probably preferable to try and fumigate those containers at source and fix it as far as on the foreign end before it comes into the country because you're going to have your containers moving through the system that much quicker. Mm -hmm. no, that, that is obviously the desire of the agriculture department. They obviously want to manage the, mitigate the risk offshore, not onshore. No, not actively. So there's been detections. However, they deem a detection to be a real problem for Australia when there's more than six bugs detected in any one shipment. Because that's when they can breed and potentially spread. Do you know in, in relation to methyl bromide, Queensland's got a standard that they've written because of their EPA levels that they have in relation to New South Wales department. One of the things that I'd like to know is, um, is the department looking at working with either the Office of the Federal Safety Commissioner or potentially Safe Work Australia to make a national standard uh, for that gas or is it something that will still sit with each state? So the, the national standard for Australia is the same for methyl bromide treatment, which is 48 grams, 24 hours, 21 degrees. And if, it's, if you're treating for commodities, you can actually adjust the chemical in relation to the temperature. With BMSB, you can't. If you don't reach 15 degrees Celsius, they deem the treatment inactive against the potential bug because you just won't kill it. That's uh, one of our problems. I think one of the things that I've found a, a lack of in the industry just as a safety professional is just the standards themselves. So we we at Visa, I, I coordinate with the contractor that comes in and uses the gas. However, when I go into the standards myself and look for them, there isn't the ease of use to find those standards in relation to distances for workers and those sort of things. I think in more in relation to the safety. Um, it's one of the things that I picked up in the industry and therefore have been using the Queensland standard here in New South Wales. So I suppose that more my question was pointed towards where is that something that the department's considering um, to make a national standard instead of a state-based as, as it is? To my knowledge, as it is, it's a state-based and, and there's the, that's outside the Commonwealth domain at this stage. The one pleasing thing that we are again working on this or for next season, and I'm hoping it's announced next week when those sessions start, is we're trying to align Australia with New Zealand at least. So the temperatures, the chemicals, the countries are unified. So we don't have the same sort of problems we have now where you know, a lot of European countries look at us as Pacific Rim. Um, and again, when we have different methods and different treatments, expectations, it makes it very difficult. Thank you. One more question um, before we go to the audience. Um, Mark, I guess this is for you in terms of what are the what are the ports doing about the, the port congestion um, going on and some of the delays we've been experiencing? I guess we've seen you know the impact of industrial action with the MUA merging with the CFMEU, um, you know, and obviously customers and, and Visa feel the effects of that, um, as well as investment in new infrastructure, which you know brings with it change as well. Um, you know, are there any upcoming changes we should be aware of, and how can we plan for that? 
Uh, I guess delays on the waterfront have been there. Scott touched on it since '98, uh, so I don't think it's linked just to the MUA and the CFMEU merger. We're, we're going through protected industrial action at the moment. Our, our agreement expired on the 28th of February. We've been very clear, not just this year, but in 2015 when I headed up the negotiations and prior to that, we, we won't meet with the union while there is industrial action um, pending or planned. It just, it, it's not a, a healthy environment to sit there and try and negotiate <coughs> when someone's... You know, um, yeah, I was, wasn't going to use that expression, but anyway. Um, so we, we have action ongoing at the moment. Those bans are significant on us. We've seen uh, rail impacted significantly last weekend, and I expect it'll be the same again this weekend. Um, we have permanents who will work in their um, <coughs> paid grade, if I put it that way, but they won't work up a high grade. And most of our regularly engaged employees are the lowest grade in terms of what we call a grade two. So they can't drive an RTG, or they can't drive a ship to shore crump. So instead of manning 18 cranes a day, we're currently manning about 10, uh, Monday to Friday. And across the weekend, instead of getting about 16 cranes, we're running about five. So um, there's no light at the end of our tunnel. We are talking to the union leadership about getting back together. It's hurting uh, us, it's hurting our employees, and we know it's hurting the industry. Um, Hopefully we don't end up with, as we did in 2015, um, 15 months or 18 months of, of protracted negotiations. Um, hopefully both sides will see a bit of sense and we can get back around the table. But um, it's it's a dynamic that's changing every day. But those those delays, unfortunately because of industrial action, are, are likely to stay. Um, some things we, we try and ensure that we don't do is from an industry perspective. Um, the three stevedores, their enterprise agreements, none of them line up. So you know, one of the things we, we the MUA, I think, would like to see is ourselves and Patrick both negotiating at the same time, which would be <coughs> devastating potentially in the industry. And there is no way that we would allow that to happen, or Patrick, to make sure that you know, we get some clear air um, from an industry perspective. But um, how long's a piece of string? Uh, we will be negotiating for a little while, I would expect. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we'd like to go to the audience now. If anyone would like to ask a question to any of our panelists up here, please raise your hand, and Krista will come around <coughs> with the microphone for you. Who's going to be first? There's got to be one. Sarah, thank you. Um, just, in regards to the, just in regards to the empty container redirection, some of you guys were talking about having 12-hour notification for the transport guys so they can get them back on time. Why has that not happened? We would like that. We leave Erskine Park potentially with four containers on a truck destined for an empty container park. We sit in the rank for an hour, two hours, and we get there. And then when we get to the gate, we're then told, because a redirection has come into effect while we're driving down the M5, um, that we may get two of those containers off. We may not get any of them off. Um, we might get one of them. That truck's then potentially <laughs> marked to go into a stevedore. And it's still got con containers on. So the disjoint is horrific. If we're one second late into the port, we get wrong zones and no-shows, um, which can occur. And again, that part of the supply chain then has the the next effect in play, so. Um, it just seems like you've got to pay notice. 100%, that's what, we're, that's what we're advocating for. And, and that's a matter for the, for the shipping lines with their suppliers for empty container park providers. Um, and it happens in other ports. So uh, through the container chain system, a notification in Melbourne will come out, for example, and say, there'll be a redirection on, but it'll start from tomorrow at 6 a.m. Yeah. So now it's coming up to 12, 12 fine, noon. And, and at least the planners then can go, okay, well, I was going to do that, but now I've got to do this. Okay. But if you've got a truck already heading to the facility that the shipping line legitimately told you to go to, well, only to be turned the around at the gate. shipping line not letting you guys know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, 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 I'll in the middle, too, Joe. Yeah, but I can, I can do that. Before we pass out on the shipping line, too, I'll just touch on something. If the EDO, EODO is being sent to the... Empty container park, which we know is less than 50%, it's the worst state in Australia. In Perth, it's 95%. We have visibility. We've got 50 redirections on the screen that are coming and going every minute. We don't even have an EIDO, so at least if the EIDO is in the system, when we go to book the slot, it'll go, bah, bah, no. Or there's, there's a redirection in place, so it won't allow you to do the wrong thing. What's an EIDO? A delivery order. Let me, do you want me to touch on that? Yeah. Like, I hate, I hate it when the industry is, everybody's the same in the industry and everybody's being painted with the same brush. 
But when you talk about <coughs> carriers that don't have proper EDI connectivity, when you talk about carriers that don't manage their empty evacuation as far as out of the depots and out of the terminals properly, those are the carriers that, generally speaking, don't know where to put their containers next because they don't have that transparency uh, within you know, transmittals of every five minutes, every 20 minutes in terms of what their stock levels look like. So they're redirecting as far as live on the spot, which is creating a huge inconvenience to you and also to Visa and trying to organize the re-delivery of those empty containers. How do you fix it? I don't have a problem with naming and shaming because I don't believe, well, I know that we're not going to be on the list. But develop some statistics as far as in the industry. Develop some um, KPIs in the industry to make sure that if there are carriers that don't have proper EDI connectivity, put some pressure on them. And also use the carriers that do have that connectivity. If there are carriers that are not, um, they're not properly evacuating out as far as their surplus stocks, as far as out of the depots and out of the terminals, then make that known too as far as to the industry itself. And I agree that we should have a general industry discussion, get all the carriers together in one group, but it's about pressure and it's about putting pressure as far as on the carriers that are not performing. And you're not performing because you don't know where your boxes are and you're not performing because you're too congested in certain areas when you shouldn't be, when you should be managing that properly. So if transport operators like Visa, I'm not saying they're going to, or that they do in some circumstances, or other transport operators you might use, if they start putting redirection fees in place and you're paying for it, <coughs> hopefully you will then go back to the shipping lines and say, why am I incurring this additional cost through my transport operator? Don't, give you them any take it up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we've had that idea for a while. <laughs> There's another fee. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the audience? Yep, up the back, Gary. I'm just going to go to the stink funds. Um, this year, everyone told us that we we're going to be prepared and there was not going to be delays like the last year where it came on very quickly. If the numbers are right, we're going to go from 11 countries to 33. How are we ever going to keep up? With the, the fumigation and retention, because obviously it's a massive cost for retention for us. Mm. Uh, quarantine's thought process is three months is enough for industry to prepare, hence why the meetings and the rollout start next week. Um, as I said, the countries that are being included, it's, it's going to be more of Europe. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean that the volumes will be tripled. Um, however, we do have a, there's an incredibly poor alignment at the moment with certain border countries in Europe. Um, where things are treated in one country but in the others they're not or they're, they're specified and they're not. So we're getting cross infestation and all sorts of problems. So it does make sense to incorporate more so of a continent rather than countries. I suppose the one thing that I didn't mention before and, it, and I'm hoping they will ratify it, at this stage China and Korea are not in scope, uh, which is massive. Um, yeah, it does. It originates from, from Southeast Asia uh, but they do have natural predators there, which keep the bugs down. They don't have the same predators in Europe or Australia. That's why it's that's why it's just run rampant through Europe and America. Thank you. Any other questions? Yep, down front, Crystal. Yeah. Yeah, just following up on the brown stick bug, uh, I'm a food importer, and at the moment that's not such an issue for me, providing my containers are at plus fifteen C. Uh, or frozen containers, um, which are even better. But uh, do you see any changes with the food side of things and the um, fumigation that may occur with 32 extra countries being added to the list? Yeah, so one of the problems that we have, and, and again, if you, if you look back to the Australian Trusted Trader mechanism around secure supply chain, we believe that biosecurity should be incorporated into that, and we think it's a natural progression. I, I have a real disconnect with the way they've targeted, um, profiled classifications. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me because I can line up five boxes here of five different commodities and you can't tell me one box is more risk than the others. So I, I think it's more so about the origins and the place of um, packing and loading, which is the real problem for Australia, not necessarily the commodities. And that's one of the things that we put forward to the Inspector General as part of our report. And Visa guys do have our report and I think it's on our website and stuff. So if you want to see where that was originally started and that hasn't been released yet back by the Inspector General, so we're still waiting on that, that to come back to us. But with food, um, obviously 15 degrees Celsius is the minimum, and that's unfortunately what it is, and so people are actually having to heat containers to be able to get to the, the correct temperatures, um, including for heat treatment as well as methyl bromide and others. Uh, but the, the problem at the moment is, as I mentioned before, is sometimes the classification used on export is not the same classification as used here. And some of the classic examples, and fortunately they're not in scope at the moment, but China, 
Um, a lot of you will probably know that certain Chinese manufacturers only have certain classifications they can export out of. So they'll call goods a classification because that's all they can legally export out of China. But when it gets here and classified correctly, it's in a complete different category which may fall into scope, which causes all sorts of problems. All right. Do we have one more question to finish up with? Yep. Down in front. Excuse me, I've got one for Mark. With your prolonged negotiations with the union and the potential, you know, the potential for a new government that would, let's just say, would be a little bit more pro, uh, pro union, uh, does that cause concerns? Get it done before the election, mate. Get it done before the election. Um, does it cause, cause any more concerns? No, not really. Um, there, there's some talk that the Labor Party put some pressure on unions to try and um, not have a lot of industrial action and lead up to the federal election. My understanding is unions are making their own decision based upon the interests of their members. And the Maritime Union have done a great job in the past um, you know, doing that. Um, will we get it done before the election? There's not a chance in the world, in, in my view. Um, we are we are so far apart. Uh, the union is, is very clear in terms of what their expectations are on some claims, and they're just they're unsustainable for <laughs> us as a stevedore, let alone um, our competitors of the industry generally, because those costs end up being passed on. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but um, the federal election is not sort of sitting in our mind as an issue related to negotiations, unfortunately. Well, not unfortunately, it's just not. Um, one final one, I guess, Andrew and Jeff, it'd be interesting, you know, we've, we've talked a bit about the stink bug um, and, the, you know, the obvious ripple effects of that, you know, on the economy in terms of the delays, um, you know, and the relationship with the detention issues that we have. Could we expect any collaboration between the department and the shipping lines, you know, given their direct, in, direct investors um, that are overseas entities in terms of um, potential arrangements with detention as volumes increase as a result of the stink bugs? Never does one of these meetings not have the word detention brought up, so. <laughs> you asked me earlier, so I had to bring it up. <laughs> uh, look, I think that um, our preference is 100% as far as the fumigated origin point overseas, because that eliminates so much congestion, so many delays and things like that. If there are extreme circumstances, we work with our customers on a one-to-one -one -one basis, and if there is relief that's needed due to probably more extreme positions in terms of that something happened that we'll listen to that case and then we'll make a we'll make a judgment call on it. And generally speaking, we'll be favorable to it. But if it's a matter of that a container was not fumigated overseas and it should have been, if it was a matter of that it's just taking a little bit longer, it's a little bit harder compared to something that's been obstructing as far as the, the flow of that container um, and, uh, and also setting the appointment as far as to get the fumigation done. But we'll work with anybody if it's in any any extreme situation. We'll try and help. Okay, good. So James, just one question from a YouTube yep. watcher, actually. Oh, great. Yeah, maybe this is this one's for you, Andrew. <laughs> we have heard that there may be a rebate on fumigation costs for companies due to the stink bug. Is this true? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, YouTube. Uh, yeah. But just on that point around around yeah. the quarantine, I suppose the analogy I would use is. When you look at the customs, our border team here, when they have their x-ray facilities in place, if you lodge your documentation and manifest prior to arrival of the, the vessel I understand to be, then what happens when the, the container x-ray facility has released the cargo back into the system, I believe the sea laws allow you 24 hours to get that container out. It would be lovely to have that same um, theory put in place for agricultural releases that once they're released by agriculture and processed, that then potentially we would have 24 hours to get off the Steve door from there. Or well, the detention clock starts then. <laughs> oh, yep. but Just yeah. to Jeff. Yep. I have a question. For the lady on the end here. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I've when it comes down to detection, how much of the success cases in detention where you've found illegal products as far as being brought into the country, how much of that is based on intelligent and how much of intelligence and how much is that being based on just sheer inspection and random sampling and things like that? Well, I think the official term is we are an intelligence-led yeah. organisation, so most of it is intelligence. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Even like the, with the Border Watch program, we sit in the intelligence division. Right. So any information that comes in through us would be considered intelligence-led. Okay. Great. Well, that's all we have time for. Can we please have a big round of applause for our panellists?
We also have some thank you gifts um, to present to our guest speakers and Christelle will be handling, handing them out shortly. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for Visa's 2019 Industry Forum. It's been a pleasure having you and feel free to stick around for food, coffee and some networking. Thanks.